I think the biggest thing that keeps people from starting homesteading is not having a property. Oh yeah, that's huge. Property's expensive. And only getting worse. I'm getting more and more expensive. That's such an overwhelming thing to purchase. It's not like you're gonna go and like spend $100 on a, what do you spend $100 on nowadays? <laughs> In this episode of the podcast, we want to help give some advice on how to find a cheap homestead property. And full disclosure, cheap and perfect, hmm. you're not going to get both. So if you're looking for a cheap homestead property, if you just want to start and you're looking for a cheap place, we found a couple cheap ones. <laughs> and we'll tell you how we did it. Yeah. The world that we live in is a crazy place. This is a pandemic. And a toilet paper tussle. Inflation hitting a new... They're protesting. But you and me, we can make a difference. By just starting a garden, harvesting rainwater, raising some meat chickens with a couple of friends. All these little steps, bit by bit, it makes life better for you, me, and our kids. So if you've wanted to start homesteading, or maybe just grow your homestead a little bit bigger this year, well, you found the right podcast. Cozy up, it's time for another episode of Homesteady. This episode of Homesteady is brought to you by... Do you hear that? What is it? Is That's it... the sound of my chapped hands. Is that sandpaper rubbing together? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Yours are no better. It's cold now, and I'm milking a cow, and I'm processing milk and cheese, and my hands are dry and scratchy. I'm editing videos. I'm <laughs> working on the studio for podcasting, and oh. Oh, the, that one callus you got this year is I'm really starting to it. bug you. <laughs> <laughs> you love the product that we're talking about today. I do. It's one of my favorite things from Laurel Mountain Soap. It's their lotion bar. So yeah, it's like lotion that you would normally get in a bottle and pump out into your hands. Yeah, I, like I need sound. another I need Podcast another lotion audience bar. I love this. <laughs> yes. Hi everybody. But it's in a bar, which means it's super moisturizing. Yeah, it doesn't have the liquid in the moisturizer like a lotion would, so it doesn't evaporate off your skin the minute you apply it and actually dry your hands out, which is what most lotions you're buying from the store are doing. They're actually making your hands drier. Why would Big Pharma oh, no. want to produce a product oh, no. for moisturizing your hands that made them drier? Oh. I don't know. Maybe so they could sell you more lotions and creams? Mm. You'll love this bar from Laurel Mountain Soap. And she's got unscented, if you're really sensitive to fragrances. They're all ingredients, you know what they are. Jocelyn makes your stuff with high quality butters and solid oils that melt with the heat of your body so that the lotion absorbs quickly into your skin. Unlike a lot of big pharma's lotions, which actually have preservatives in them that can block the absorption of the lotion into your skin. That's the whole point of this stuff. We use Laura Mountain's soaps, deodorants, lotions. Lip balms. Great, great gifts and really nice for this time of year when everything's getting so dry. If you want to see them in an episode of our podcast or listen to them, they taught us about soap making from goat's milk soap, which is what they make their soap and lotion from. I thought you meant listen to the lotions. If you like, want to listen to their lotion. Listen to this bar. It's amazing. Doesn't it sound so pure? <laughs> Laurel. L-A-U-R-E-L, mountainsoaps.com. Don't forget to use the coupon code HOMESTEADY for a discount off your order. We are not millionaires. <laughs> yeah, we're going to really uh, have a full disclosure here of our financial state. We we're have, not millionaires. In our last episode, we talked about how we started dreaming of homesteading, and we were literally going to just buy like I think at the time it was like two or three acres. Yeah. My parents had, remember they had two acres in the middle of Danbury, Connecticut, which if you're familiar with Danbury, Connecticut, it's not like homesteading capital of the world. No, I, I don't even know <laughs> if they'd let us have chickens on two acres That's in why Danbury. we didn't move there because yeah. they wouldn't let us have nothing. chickens on two anything. acres. So we have a long history of searching for tiny, cheap, not perfect homestead properties. We've got pretty good at it. Proud of that. Yeah. 
and there have been some big lessons in the, over the years of finding homesteads, moving to homesteads, watching other people along their journey that we've kind of compiled. And whenever somebody comes to us and it's like, hey, I want a homestead. Well, why haven't you started? I don't have land. Or I'd like to expand my homestead. I already do everything I can do in my backyard, but right. I want to do more. Or I, I want to move away from this super urban location. What can I do? You're a Zillow aficionado. Welcome. We are millennials after all. What else do we do but look on Zillow for properties we can't afford? <laughs> What's that college humor video, Wasting Your Life on Zillow? That's why I love wasting my life on Zillow. With Zillow, you can easily discover all the options. From up and coming neighborhoods to more established ones, Zillow helps you find the perfect home that you could absolutely never afford. <laughs> uh, so you're always looking for a new property. And actually, we mentioned this in our YouTube video about how we're going off grid and starting a new homestead from scratch. We've been looking for years. Yeah. We're not, we're, this is not like a month ago we decided we better go find a couple properties. Spoiler alert, we're gonna talk about a few properties we found today the pros and cons and how we finally picked one. So at the end of this episode of here, we actually picked a property. Yeah, we were looking in Connecticut for a larger property, which is why I think when we got the offer to come down here and manage this farm, it appealed to us because we were already kind of feeling like we'd like a bigger property. Yeah, so that was, that was a good lesson in itself, just going from our apartment to that 10 acres in Connecticut and actually finding affordable homestead property in Connecticut. Uh, so we have three awesome tips, awesome lessons for you to take away from this episode. Shall we dive right in? Yeah. These are the things that have helped us be able to locate now two properties that will be, one of them will be our future homestead. And like we said, this is, I mean, we found our Connecticut homestead. We've over the years found nice parcels. What's number one? I forgot. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask. This is an awesome way to find some places no one has found yet. Or places that aren't even for sale yet. That's why no one's found them. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, so if you can pinpoint the area or state that you'd like to end up in, learn more about it, figure out what, what's the location, north, south, east, west, and just get a map. And I've been using Onyx, which is a hunting Ooh. a hunting app that lets you find parcels in the area and see who owns these parcels. And you can find the person who owns them and then get more information about that. And you can say, hey, are you interested in selling any property? I feel like to a lot of people this will seem crazy because we, we want the property. We want our 20 acres. Yeah. But there are a lot of investors, land investors, um, land holders, farmers who are willing to part with a few acres, five acres, 10 acres. It's not an unheard of thing for no. them. No, because if you think about in their mind, why, why do they even have, may, maybe it's a family farm, right? And they have a hundred acres because it's a family farm and they have 100 acres. Time marches on. They're not making a great living off the family farm. The older members of the family are dying. Yep, they're slowing down. Now, they're not going to go sell the family farm right now. They're still living on it. They're still using it. But times is tough. And let's say you were to suddenly one day give them a call while they're already dealing with times is tough. Hi, I'm a nice person. I have a nice family. We are raising chickens and, and, you know, tell your story. Remember this, you're pitching anytime you're interacting in this experience, you know, buying and selling land, there's story involved. So, so give them your nice story, give them a smile. Especially if it's somebody who has owned a family farm, right? It's de near and dear to them. Yeah. And they would love, trust us. They would love to see someone who loves farming and animals take it over. Uh, I would be interested in buying five or 10 acres a parcel. From parcel. Now what's that they're going to do is they're going to look at their map where their house is at the, you know, say their house is at the middle. They're going to find the way farthest five or 10 acres that they don't ever go to. Yeah. They don't like, and they've been paying taxes on and the taxes go up every year. And they're going to think, you know what? An extra 20, 30, 
40 grand right now and not having to pay those taxes could go a long way towards just keeping me happy the next 10 or 20 years on this farm. Or you or, might find out they're newer owners and they don't want it anyway. They just inherited it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like maybe the farmer has passed away. Uh, his kids have been taking care of it. It's, it, it's, um, it seems impossible, <laughs> like I said, to think like somebody is selling property, but it's happening all over. And there's, there's actually two properties we're going to talk about later in this episode, but, but th- I should say three really parcels. We found through asking directly to, looking at a map, reading a name, getting the contact information. And I can think oh, right now in our circle of how many older people do we know who have passed away recently who have large properties and they're kind of like, what's going to happen with them? Yeah. Even though they're not listed. Uh, so is there somebody in your circle in your acquaintances, um, you know, just think out cousins, uncles, uh, distant relatives, <laughs> or yeah, find that area you want to look into and get to know the area. Ask around. Uh, the story of my brother, how That's he found one. his home, his beautiful property. Is it 50 acres? Yeah. With and, a pond and a house. Oh, yeah. He, he saw it. He liked it. He went up to the people and he offered to buy it. He knocked on the door. They came to the door. Now, he was local to the area. He knew he liked the house. And I think he knew, the people knew of the families. He wasn't a total, but he was pretty much a stranger. Pretty yeah. Pretty much a cold call. Yeah. And they said they had been talking about selling their house. I remember she said she believed in signs. And the fact that he walked up to the door and asked that day, she felt, you know what? The universe is telling me it's time to move on. And It, it gives me, it honestly gave me chills, that story. It's just so like... Wow, that's awesome. And this, I've seen this happen for people looking for um, space for their tiny home, where they just see a parcel they like. They go and ask the landowner, and they are they let them rent it for however much a year. Don't forget, he wound up without that house. Now think about, we're talking about today getting cheap homestead property. What immediately adds to the cost of buying a new property that's listed? Infrastructure, house. Sorry, no. <laughs> it's not listed. It's good to do a really good outline before you do a podcast. So good. Um, no, competition. Makes the price go up. The minute you're going to bid on a property that's listed and you're like, oh, been listed for 30 days. Ooh. Especially the way and the market realtor, was a year ago, right? Now you got to pay a realtor. You got to, your realtor is instantly going to say, well, you know, they're listed at two, but you better offer 220 because, <laughs> I don't think because the realtor, do that. they do. They do not. They want that sweet, that is sweet so, realtor money. They never money. tell you go more. You, they know they you want to go less. No, they do well, not. They're okay. always like, oh my it depends goodness. what the market's like. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Not buying a listed property with a, no realtors, the person selling isn't giving the realtor money. The person, you are not giving a realtor anything. So... There's room for that. So just by finding a piece before it gets listed, you're wiping out competition. You're you're getting rid of them realtors. If you're a realtor in the audience, we like realtors. We've had some nice ones. I'm just I'm just teasing. yeah. I was thinking like if somebody would come up to you right now and say, "Hey, I'll give you thirty grand for your car." Well, I didn't have to do any work to list oh it. I didn't have to put forth any effort to get it out to an audience. And, uh, hey, I can buy a new car for that. And I've been thinking about a change anyways. Sure, let's do it. Yeah. It does take a lot of the uh, obstacles out for the seller. Yeah. Don't be afraid to ask. (laughs) Big gulp in there. We're sharing the three best tips we have used to find cheaper property. But I know a lot of you listening have found a homestead property for cheap as well. If there's something we're not covering, please comment either back at our website, thisishomesteady.com, on the blog post for this episode, or if you're watching here on YouTube, just comment below. Don't be afraid to go off. Grid. Oh yeah, this is a this is a good one. Okay, the next point we talked about this in our recent video. We're going off grid, and it's not because you or me 
are doomsday preppers. No. It's not because... We know so much about solar <laughs> electricity. There's a poster in uh, Pennsylvania we drive by a lot that's very pro coal. Billboard. Billboard, billboard yeah. yeah. The wind dies, the sun sets, coal, coal is, is more reliable. Which, I'm not sure that's accurate, coal people. <laughs> like, the wind dies, the sun sets, but it then rises it does every come day. Back up. Yeah, so. <laughs> anyway, we're not super, like, it's not, we're, we're not, not going off grid because. knowledgeable about this stuff yet. We're so in love with it or anything. The real reason we're going off grid is because off grid allows you to buy properties that are more affordable. It really has opened up. Uh, what properties we've been able to consider buying because oh, one of them is way far off the road <laughs> and a well will cost 20000 to dig. And we know because we got a quote. Yeah, yeah. And electricity to it, we're still waiting on that, uh, the engineer to tell us, but that's probably uh, fifteen grand if they do a lot of the work. So, yeah, the price of getting on the grid can be kind of outrageous for some areas. If a developer buys a piece of property, goes in there and puts in power, puts in a driveway, puts in water. a well and a water system, all that costs a ton of money. Then let's say he decides he's getting out of there, but the property's for sale. He wants that money back. There's, he's not Yeah, gonna, there's value there. Yeah, anyone sees, oh, look it, we're ready to build a house, Perfect. So when you go looking for property that has already power run to it, already some kind of water system or even utilities, it is worth more. So it even as we more. learned, if there's a driveway, it really any work that's been done on the property really increases the value of it. Even stuff that we look at or I looked at previously to this, like like a driveway <laughs> is just a driveway, right? They're there. No. We are going to introduce you to, you may have heard them on the podcast in the past, but my parents. My parents run a company called AJM Earth. And for the last 35 plus years, because they started- As old as when, you are. Uh, yeah. They've been developing properties, doing excavating for people, earthworks, foundations, building, helping with home builds, uh, and then doing all kinds of different landscaping things. So we actually talked on a YouTube video recently with my dad about basic infrastructure to get onto the properties that we're looking at. And he talked about the cost for driveways. This is just driveways and doing some trenching for utilities. Mm. And he was talking about a, a, a project he's doing in Connecticut right now where just the trenching for utilities is $15,000. So it's just the trenching. That's not even having the power company put the line in. Right. That's like the stuff we'll say, hey, we can do that. What we just let, let's get a trencher. Let's run on this, this conduit or, you know, the pipe up there and they'll. Yeah. Like that's not even getting you power. On the other hand, when you're looking at a property that has nothing done, right? It's raw raw land, no driveway, no power, no utilities. A lot of times you're going to find those further away from town, further away from... Even, yeah, off of roads that aren't even maintained in the winter, right? That's They're a possibility. They're going to be pretty remote. Yeah, a lot of these... Gridlessness makes me think of gridlessness. Oh, their advice was great. We interviewed um, gridlessness. Boy, that was a long time ago on the podcast. I'll put a link to that episode. I planted a, good a one. seed, though, I feel like, for us. Planted that oh, seed. Oh, yeah. I very rarely, and I don't mean this in a like offensive way, I very rarely interview people who I am envious of because most of the people we interview have a similar life yeah, to us. Yeah, we're all kind of doing the same thing. But gridlessness, I remember being like, oh, man, I want that life. <laughs> Well, I don't really need to work, which means I can spend tons of time with the family, tons of time homesteading, hunting. Jeff and Rose are living an off-grid dream life with their family. This is the story of how they built this life. Yeah. If you want what everyone else has, then go for it. And if you want something different, like do it. They're up in 
Canada. Yeah, way up in Canada, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and they're always catching salmon and hunting moose and panning for gold. And very off grid. So yeah, they're very right their their quad and their driveway. Well, our approach was to uh, kind of just reset our our standard of of living down to the camping level. <laughs> we and we both love camping and and hiking and backcountry and and hunting outdoors. So we're we're totally used to staying in a tent for a week or two. And we thought, well, why don't we just start camping? We'll put up a pop tent, and uh, and then you know as we'll we'll figure out which priorities kind of bubble to the surface, right? And as things kind of came up and we're like, wow, we really got to deal with this. Uh, we dealt with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the things that we've built and spent our time and our money on, they just, the priorities presented themselves and we kind of addressed them. And their advice was get land. His line was get land that's cheap like borscht. We, we actually looked around the province and found uh, a location that was good and a land piece of land that was good. And it was cheap like borscht, a 40 acre property but with friends, with good friends, uh, we split the property. We, you know, we kind of got our 20 and they got their 20. Uh, it had no driveway. It had obviously no services. Fully treated like it was like a forest. Yeah, oh, just wow. no fields or anything like that. It was uh, 20 acres for 20 grand, which is what a guy would, like what we would have spent on, uh, on rent for one year. <laughs> Cheap like borscht. Borscht? Borscht, like the Russian. Borscht? Borsh? How do you say, like the soup? The Russian soup, yeah. The yeah, like cheap soup. like borscht. All right. Am I saying that right? I don't know. Borscht? I don't know. You're more uh, Eastern European than me. How would you say borscht? That's too much pressure. I have borscht? I have no <laughs> idea. It's the Scottish in me overtakes ha, it. got to get the borscht. <laughs> that was Irish. I'm more Irish than Scottish, so you sorry. Are. I am. I won't do the Lucky Charms bit. I won't do I the won't Lucky do Charms it. bit. Trying so hard not to. So yes, lucky. remote. Think remote. We're not going to find it. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Couldn't help it. You're not going to find it in Danbury, Connecticut. No, you're not. No, and here's the thing: because it's more remote, less people. Again, less competition. Less people vying for it. So it's going to be cheaper to buy the property. Now. If you go building a huge modern home that needs a giant mm -hmm. solar system and a giant water system, and a big you're driveway gonna, to get all that yeah construction in you, there, you can very quickly turn this cheap land into a much more expensive project. Like so I, I know there's people who are like yelling at us through their earphones right now, like, "But that's going to be more money." Well, it depends. But yeah, you, you have to be determined to go in and do it simply like gridlessness they right. didn't like take up the topsoil off their road and compact it they're going around in a quad and a yeah. snowmobile they and had riding the, horses through the woods i remember they talked about getting groceries on the quad and like grocery which okay now some of us our life we can't grocery quad our groceries back and forth for two hours because we got to go off to the work but their whole lifestyle changed to this off-grid life where they worked remotely. They made a living off their computers and off the internet, which was slow, but they could get satellite internet. So the point is you can, by finding an off-grid property and changing your lifestyle. Yeah, from, it'll be a big life change. Yes, you can do this. And we know because we're currently designing. And don't forget, um, you don't have to take all the steps at once. So if you buy your remote property, what do you want to do first? Do, do you just oh, want to get there? Do you this just want to get point. there and live there? All right. Yeah. And you got your job all set up. You can work remote. Well, what do you need? Yeah. Put up your Starlink and your camper and start. We are huge proponents on this channel of just starting. We literally have a little course about getting started with chickens that is called the Just Start Chicken Course, which I'll link to if you're interested. There are people who always write us and say, I'd love to, but I can't because I don't have the land. If you buy the cheap off-grid, maybe it's a few hours from you, you'll have that wonderful feeling of a project to work on, to actually work on, not dream anymore. 
I know a lot of people listening and watching are in the dream space, and there's a time for that. But you want to eventually move into... You want to take steps. Working. And even if it's just owning the land now that you go to on the weekend, how excited are you going to be you to got your go? Land. And maybe yeah. you set up a campsite. And now you could do a little maybe, you know, Airbnb your campsite when you're not there and make a little more money from it so you move along the dream quicker. Right. And, Maybe a project or two each year. Uh, this year we're going to put in a pond or this year we're going to put in a driveway. Or we've got our camper set up. Oh, this this is great. You know what? I'm going to get I'm going to get some solar in there. Okay. Well, now you've learned about solar. Yeah. The solar's great. I want some water. How much does it cost to drill a well here? Oh, well, I can afford that right now because I've been Airbnb-ing it. So now I can afford to put a well in. Yeah. You don't have to blow into that property and and develop it start to finish 100% American standard right away. Yeah, absolutely not. And if it's a cheap property, you probably could actually afford while still making your life changes and transitions to at least own it and enjoy the property, whether that's camping, fishing, hunting, hiking, timber, firewood. There's so many cool things you can do without even living there. Yeah. Which will get you further along in your homestead dreams. So off-grid, don't be afraid, but remember... It's going to be a lifestyle change. Yeah. And and we're never endorsing jumping in without knowledge first. Yeah, no. So we're not saying like, hey, this guy's selling two acres of land for 50000 Hey, that's cheap enough for me. I'm going to get it. You know, go yeah. look at it. Establish what the water's like. Make sure you're being smart about your land purchasing decisions. And I actually want to add, we are... We've often said in the past, we don't think every homesteader should go off grid. This episode is about how to find some cheap land to start. But if you're not into the idea of off grid, if you don't want to develop all your infrastructure and have battery banks and solar systems, then disregard that (laughs) and ignore it. Take the other good bits from this episode. Off grid isn't for everybody, but if you're willing to do it, yeah, or it can excited be a really to do it. good way to find some inexpensive property. Great way. So don't be afraid to ask, even if a property isn't listed. Don't be afraid to go off grid if, you know, you got that little uh, notion in your heart that you could do it. <laughs> and point number three is don't be afraid of the diamond in the rough. One whose worth lies far within the diamond. The diamond in the rough. Diamond in the rough. Oh, where are my Aladdin fans at? What is you that? want to... What does a diamond in the rough mean to you? For a property. Yeah. Imagine your dream homestead, right? Imagine the beautiful pastures and the ponds, the nice little barn cozy house, fencing. Now, get rid of all that. (laughs) (laughs) So it's nothing. There's none of that. (laughs) Nothing. Uh, I think it's, I'm one of, I'm not super handy. I'm not super, you know, handy husband, your typical farmer guy. But I do come from a background of construction development. Right. That's uh, excavating. Excavating. And in particular, the bulk of my 15 years of work as an excavator was generally putting in septic systems, which is something you'll need to figure out on your off-grid homestead. And because of that, I was able to, for 15 years of my life, show up on raw land properties or even older properties that needed like new infrastructure put in. And see, wow, this property is a mess. It's super steep. There's trees everywhere. But with some equipment, some time, we can level this. We can tear that down and push that over. And now we have a nice site to work with. Yeah, I think that's one of your strengths. And you and your dad together, your strengths are seeing the potential. Yeah. Because a lot of these places you would go to, they were old, either old houses who had issues with water right a house was put in totally a wrong spot the drains weren't done right my dad prides himself in taking on really challenging jobs he loves the harder and more crazy a job looks the weirder a property is he got a call from a guy one time 
Amin was the guy's name. And uh, he, <laughs> Amin, he lived on like a hillside, very steep hillside leading into a river. And he left, he talked to my dad on the phone and said, hey, I need you to come out and look at this property. I feel like it's not unusual in Connecticut because people are just oh, like crammed, everywhere. crammed in yeah. there. Yeah. And he said, I need you to come out and look at my property. And my dad was like, yeah, okay. But it's on a steep hillside and there's a river at the bottom. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll call you later this week. We'll schedule a time. You're going to call, right? <laughs> yes, I'm going to call. Please call. Please call. Even just to tell me to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> my dad said don't worry i'll call you to tell you to go to hell don't worry <laughs> he was so worried that my dad wasn't going to call him back because so many construction workers had seen the property and then been like no way i'm not doing this but my dad we we came in we looked at the property he he got a special track machine so we could do the steep hills and we did it we did the job no problem so we like finding the the property the diamond in the rough the average person looks at it maybe and says like, <laughs> calls you to tell you to go to hell. <laughs> but we can see the potential. Where could we get a road? Where could we level some spots? Where could we flatten? Yeah. And this is where this advice is, is good advice if you have the eye and the, the ability to see this or if you have people in your life who you can bring in on this, mm -hmm. even if it's professionally. If you don't know what you're looking for, it could be hard to spot a diamond in the rough. You could get into trouble with this bit of advice. You could wind up being like, oh, this is a diamond in the rough and really it's just a lump of coal. But, and that's where we're gonna give you some guidelines here of what we look for. Look at a property that's not developed, that's not appealing, that people don't really want. What do we actually look for to say, you know what, although this is ugly and nasty right now, there's potential here. Uh, I think first step is get all the legal things straightened out that's a great great so bit of advice see what the oil gas mineral rights are on there make sure you own them me yep. in particular i like to own everything on my property yep um see what kind of liens or any sort of uh do you have what do you call it the uh the right of putting a driveway in there easements and easements it, does any the property easements you need. make sure there's a way you can get to the property that's a if it's landlocked. another great because any legal stuff you're going to have to do here we're going to tell you what's a lump of coal and what's a diamond in the rough. Ready? Nice and clear. If there's any legal issues, that is a lump of coal. Yeah. You can be locked in. So if let's say your property you found is landlocked. There's no driveway existing to it. And you think, well, I'll just put a driveway over one of my neighbor's properties. They're not using it. Seems, I'll just say, hey, do you mind if I put in a driveway? I got to get to my property. They mind. Yeah. They always mind. <laughs> my dad's been in a, a driveway legal battle for probably 10 years on one of his properties that has been landlocked. There was a driveway and then it didn't get used. And now it's, well, can we put a power line in here? Oh, you don't have the easement, you know? So if there's legal thousands issues- Thousands of dollars worth of lawyer fees to get this sorted That's out. a lump of coal. Legal issues, if the property is not being bought up because of legal stuff, it's a lump of coal, forget it. You don't have the endless budget for legal battles. No. Now- the checks out there, no legal issues. Okay, let's move forward. Number two, way to identify a lump of coal from diamond in the rough. There's a lot of times you'll find properties that are just raw land that are available that have a lot of wetlands. You might yes. be attracted to this. You might think, oh, this is great. There's a creek running through. So and beautiful. I can, I can manage this creek and, and build it for my own needs. And we actually, one of the properties we're going to tell you about has a creek. <laughs> But be very careful. If your property is all what is referred to as wetlands, a lot of times your states will highly regulate what can be done, what can be put into it, and basically your property will be a nice stream you can do nothing with. Yeah, you can't, in a lot of states, you can't divert streams or disturb them in any way, save but for like, you can plant things along the banks that prevent erosion. Right. So. If it has a stream on it, which we're going to talk about a little bit, that's okay. As long as the property isn't like a long, thin piece that follows the wetlands. So make sure you actually have some dry land. Having a creek, awesome thing on a property, but make sure there's also other. If you find a cheap piece of property with a creek and it's just that, that's why. Yeah, don't do it. Yeah, that's a lump Water of Water everywhere, even if it, it 
it's fine with your state regulations. You can't build on water. Yeah, that's another good point. Just too much water in general. Yep. Marshlands. I guess you can build on them. That's (laughs) not an... Yeah, you can build on them, but it's hard to homestead, farm, cows, and everything on marshlands. Here's another good thing to look for. It Because you want to have livestock, make sure to check if you're looking at a property, any zoning regulations. Maybe where you're looking doesn't allow any of the animals you want to have, any of the things. Like so. we said in Danbury, it was you could have acres and not be able to have chickens, much less pigs or goats or donkeys or cows. Now, when some people think about a homestead or a small family farm, the picture that comes to mind is kind of the picture on the side of the Pepperidge Farm bread loaf box. <laughs> I'm going to picture that. I can't envision this. Is it? Did you have cinnamon raisin bread today? Is Ooh. that why you're thinking of this? <laughs> it was Pepperidge Farm. <laughs> nice red barn, big cornfield in the back, the cows out in the side of the barn, and everything's flat and green and wide open to the beautiful sunshine. Don't be afraid. Here's where we're talking about a diamond in the rough. Don't be afraid to find a property that is not flat, that has some hills or even mountains. Mountains. Now, we don't want steep cliffs. Unless you just like goats. And Unless then... goats do great on cliffs. Um, this is one of the ways you can find a diamond in the rough. A farm, a business that is producing crops, needs flat land to run a tractor. So you'll always find flat parcels to be worth more money. relatively flat. If they can drive a tractor on it and there's good dirt, they can make money from it and they can get a loan, which will allow that value to be... be, uh, Higher. Yeah. If a farmer can't go and plant corn there, but you could raise some goats, you're looking at a nice diamond in the rough. This is one of the ways I feel that we were able to find the property we did in Connecticut. It was not flat. It was a lot of steep terrain. Yeah, a lot of mountain rocks, lots of rocks. Not a lot of nice topsoil. You would never imagine growing crops there. But over time, we flattened some area to plant crops. Cut down some trees. We opened up the canopy and planted pasture on rolling hills. You might not be able to bring a tractor in, but you could bring some cows or some goats in often. Cows can take some terrain. And goats like hills. Goats love hills. <laughs> Sheep, right? So start looking at properties that are not flat farmland, but instead hilly. Yeah, have some elevation. Elevation changes. Uh, and that opens you up to valleys. That opens you up to mountains. Mountainsides. Harder to develop going to take some real, you know, elbow grease and grit, but they'll be cheaper. Good place to go. Don't uh, look at a property that's ugly (laughs) and think that it's a lump of coal. Your property might be ugly. Why? Maybe loggers have been in there already and have logged this property. This is what people will sometimes do. They'll buy a property Oh, when it's cheap, hang on to it for years and years. Now it's got mature hardwood trees and they'll harvest them. Now they don't have any interest in hanging on to this property any longer. They've taken the value out of it. And it looks ugly. The loggers Loggers. have been in there. They've made roads, which could be good. But they've also chopped down trees and there's stumps everywhere and there's tree limbs everywhere. It can look a mess. Piles of stumps, piles of dead trees. And, And loggers often are required by, you know, DEPs, Department of Environmental Protection, to do so much so they don't ruin land. And they'll do that much, and that's it. They're not trying to be... uh, I'm not dissing every logger ever. If you're out there and you're a conservationist logger, I love you. But (laughs) call me. But uh, (laughs) most uh, most of the stuff we've seen that's been logged afterward doesn't look great. No, it's not beautiful. And it can look... Like like the land has been just raped and pillaged, and why would I ever want to buy that? Yeah, Fern Gully. Why would I ever want to buy that? There's still potential there for you because you're not looking at it to timber, and you won't be able to for years. Uh, but they've cleared some space for you. They've put in a semi-passable road. So even if it's ugly, it could still be a really nice homestead option. Absolutely.
All right, so I think that leads in really nicely to our little diamonds in the rough. <laughs> we have plenty of examples of like things we're willing to sacrifice to get started on a property. Things that we can, Im I think the key about the rough is can you improve it? Right. This is, okay, ready, bing, this is the light bulb here. It's a diamond in the rough because you can actually cut it, polish it, and then it's a diamond. But if you cut and polish coal, it's still just a littler piece of coal. You don't change it at all. Right. You're, yeah. What you get, see, if you get a diamond in the rough, it's going to be cheaper than a diamond. Right. But if you buy a lump of coal, you can't add any value to right. it. Right. So if, there, if it's just wetlands, nothing you're going to do you're is going to be able to change to that. If, if there's it's no easement. Legally restricted, you can't, you're not going to be able to afford that. Value to now, it. if the soil is garbage, if there's no visible water, if there's no passable road, right? These are things you can and you may can enjoy in there doing. And add value to it. And welcome to the two properties that we're going to tell you about that we've been going back and forth on. If you follow the YouTube channel, you know this saga. Uh, we have two, over the years, we've been looking for a property to have as our own. Mm -hmm. Because like we've said in the last episode, we're managing a family farm. We don't own it. We'd like to have our own family farm. So, Who you, you want to introduce? Yeah, uh, and I think it's important because we've taken, I think we've taken all three of these, these don't be afraid to's, and we've done it. Yeah, absolutely. So our first don't be afraid to was ask. Yep. So uh, both properties were owned by people who, they weren't posted for sale, but they were approached and we were able to um, like start the process of buying them. And the, I, we didn't talk about this when we mentioned don't be afraid to ask, but it's part of this is when you ask, you get to know people. Mm -hmm. We literally have watched the one property where we're seriously, well, Mm -hmm. Well, spoiler alert, I won't do it, but one property <laughs> we're seriously YouTube. considering, um, we saw three different owners. The original owner, we found out who it was, inquired of, that person died. The person who took over that person's estate got all their stuff, mm -hmm. didn't want all their stuff, wanted some of it, but not all yeah, of it. Yeah, because the location isn't convenient for them. Yeah, and through this chain of events, because we were asking, continually asking, we were in touch when it was time for us to get access and be able to work it. So we'll get to that property. So in a we're second. saying that is the one we purchased. <laughs> yeah. So that's the how we got that one. We won't tell you which one it is, but yeah. And the other one is kind of it had been with the same property owners for a long time, and then we knew that it was going to be for sale. Yep. So again, somebody died. Somebody. Gave up something. It over. If you keep at, if you ask, then you know things, and you keep asking. Hey, by the way. Hey, by the way. Eventually, somebody dies. Yeah. Yeah. So we <laughs> knew we had access to either one of these properties. Both are not perfect properties. No. Um, both, both are diamonds in the rough. Undeveloped, and they don't have any utilities in there. Now, one of them does have a driveway, which we'll get to how that plays in. You want to introduce your favorite, and I'll introduce my favorite, and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. See so. if I do a better job with it on the podcast, <laughs> because I was definitely outvoted for this one on YouTube. We did a video where we pitched both to the YouTube audience and asked their opinion. What would you have picked? And I would say I won that pitch. <laughs> but I would say they were all wrong. <laughs> no so. kidding. You're not a sore loser. <laughs> Well, it's sunset right now, but when it's not, it's very sunny. As you can see, it's very wide open. So I'm going to be the realtor now, right? This property is 50 acres of already timbered land. So somebody bought it and he had the lumber company come in and take all the valuable timber. So there's no more value there. But that's okay because it still has value to us. The company who took the trees out also cleared off a 
big clearing at the top of the mountain. There's no topsoil now that's kind of been washed away and there's lots of weeds, but for us, if we bring the animals in here, there's a lot of potential. We can rebuild topsoil, we can plant some pasture. No. So yeah, I like what we refer to as Sunny Mountain. It is a 50 acre parcel yep. that was just completely wooded. It does have a stream running at the base of the mountain and it was logged. So the loggers put in a road that the owner uh, then ended up refining, I guess you could say, improving, like really making much it much improving. better, putting drainage yeah. in and everything. But you go up this long, windy driveway to the top of a mountain that has been cleared by the loggers, stumped out and everything. It is not beautiful. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> the head of a bald man who still has hair around the sides. It's a bald head with a rim of forest around the side. It's my grandfather, it's granddad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess we will call it Bald Man Mountain. Bald Granddaddy Mountain. <laughs> it does have a beautiful view, though. And who, Granddad or the mountain? <laughs> don't tell it's me. It's got a Ma. really don't nice mustache me, like mine. I wonder if the podcast listeners know I have a mustache. <laughs> okay. It's important. You love your mustache. <laughs> it's a it's a mountaintop with hills. It's a mountaintop with forest all around it. Pretty thick forest, very cliff-like, not like rolling beautiful hills, but at the top it's like flat and goes down gradually and then it kind of goes yeah. straight down. There are a few edges that are pretty steep. steep. Yeah. Um, it, it is very windy and it yep. is wide open. So. Remember, you want to do a better job of convincing people. Here. I know, well, I'm just being honest. See, I'm an honest That's realtor. That's the problem. I'm a better realtor. You're too honest. Yeah. Uh, these. It's a real fixer-upper. Exactly. A little TLC. These can all be improved on. So there's no grass yet, but that's something that can be improved on. If you don't see grass, just think to yourself, what am I going to need? It's to just a blank this? slate. Uh, Bare canvas, ready for your artistry. Where we live right now, we're facing it. There's a hillside where it's all grass. And I remember as a kid playing on that hillside where it was just shale everywhere. So real brittle rocks. You would take a step and all these rocks would come falling down. But after 20 years of, and no livestock or anything, just planting grass and then mowing it. That's all my dad did was mow it, mow it, mow it, mow it. So putting that, those nutrients back in, that organic matter back in, now it's grass that feeds our cows. For how many weeks out of we the year? We have amazing. We actually have really amazing pasture, but I know from trying to get some dang lots of rocks. stakes in the ground, it's very yes, it's shallow. very yes. So although this mountaintop right now, you look at it and it's it's bald man's head. It's bare and it's not topsoil. When loggers go in, they cut the trees. If they stump it, oftentimes what happens is the stumps pull up. They pull all the topsoil with them, and it kind of Stumping it allows the topsoil to just be washed away. So you would look at this property, and a lot of people on YouTube have and said, this is barren wasteland. It looks like a desert. Don't do it. Don't do it. But we know from having worked <laughs> hillsides and mountains, mountains and yeah, shale <laughs> and all these things, we know. How quickly animals can put life back into an area. It was Alan Savory, right? Yeah. Who was in Africa? Alan Savory. Yeah. How they just completely reestablished pasture in these wastelands with proper management you can you can get things growing and you can do it people say oh it takes 10 years to build no, they say 100 years for an inch, to build of, top an inch of topsoil but with animals you can have too much topsoil yeah quickly so right. we've seen it we've done it we've planted pastures in connecticut we've improved pastures where we are currently and I've been following some people. I'm going to throw this out there. Grant Woods, he's been on our podcast a long, ago. long time ago. GrowingDeer.tv. He manages a giant property in the Ozark Mountains with a system that he refers to as the buffalo system. To understand that principle of this mulch releasing nutrients and nutrient cycling going on soil, consider it a great prairie. Guys, no one was adding any fertilizer or lime out there and for a long time, it was supporting millions of buffalo, elk, deer, 
and other large critters. Or look at Yellowstone right now or other large national parks. They're supporting a lot of critters off native vegetation. No one's adding fertilizer and that's because of the nutrient cycle occurring. When we till, we disrupt that nutrient cycle, and that's why we have to have synthetic inputs. But with this system, that's two parts. No tilling, we're never tilling the soil, and making sure something's growing as many days out of year as possible. And not just something growing, but a blend of plants, different species, because they make different contributions to the next crop. The buffalo system sounds perfect, right? It's saving money, it's saving time. But like all systems, to achieve those goals, it takes a little time and proper management. Basically just mimics what livestock do. It mimics what the buffalo did on the Great Plains. You grow a diverse mix of plants, you trample or, or crimp them down, you move on and let them regrow. And he has built rich black topsoil full of worms on top of nothing but gravel and shale. It's incredible. And he's done it in just a few years. So, Sunny Mountain, it's bare, not a lot of topsoil right There's now. There's no electricity there, but we um, the I'm tools. not afraid to go off grid. <laughs> I'm a little intimidated by it right now. Yeah. But that's why we have uh, the internet and like, <laughs> like some really fantastic resources that we're going to be utilizing. I think that's a future podcast. Let us know. Email us or comment on whatever you're watching or listening. Would you like to hear our episode, Things We're Afraid Of, when it comes to going off grid? Because we are, I mean, we're normal humans who like to, you know. Well, yeah, the conveniences. When have yeah. we ever lived without you go camping for a week and when you come back, you're like, oh, light switches. There are oh, times great. late at night where I'm thinking about, ooh, this might be crazy, but that'll be another podcast. So that's that's our mountain diamond in the rough. Yep. It's ugly. It really is ugly. Now, being a mountain, there is no mountain stream here. <laughs> you did talk about there's a stream at the bottom. There's but a stream at the bottom. If you picture the mountain at the very base, there's a stream, but we could not use it because we would be building at the top, on the top of the bald man's head. But what can we do about that? This is a great question because, again, diamond in the rough, you're not going to find a cheap homestead property that has a gorgeous pasture and a, nice and a beautiful pond. farm Wouldn't pond. Wouldn't you love that? Right? I mean, that's what you have to understand. This episode's about cheap property. It's not about perfect. It's not about beautiful. We're not telling you how to find the perfect homestead property. Hmm. It's about cheap. <laughs> There's not going to be a great farm pond or a beautiful creek running nice through it. Nice green pasture with a farm pond, yeah. So you can put in a pond. I've been following Greg Judy for years. Greg Judy, if you don't follow him, he's got great, great grazing operation. And every pro every farm he leases, he puts in a pond. You get somebody, now he's got good clay in his soil, that helps. But there's ways to put in ponds without clay. And you just got to do your research. Again, topic for another podcast. So although there is no water, and that's the other reason people are like, don't do Sunny Mountain, don't do Sunny Mountain. We're going to be putting in a pond with the help of my parents, who one of the That's things they, they do. do is ponds and dams and all that sort of stuff. So we'll be able to share that on future episodes of the podcast. And that is Sunny Mountain. So beautiful mountaintop, lots of sun. A beautiful mountaintop. The view is beautiful, the it's mountaintop gorgeous. is less so right the gorgeous now. Is but gorgeous view. Potential, potential. We can improve. We can add value to that property. It is a diamond in the rough. Right now it looks very rough. And the comments on YouTube would would say so. So many people were like, no, 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 run, 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 run. It is a diamond in the rough. We will add value to it. I feel like I feel like you uh you cheated me. You cheated of me of my win. I feel like because you're the one that edits the videos, you edit Ooh. it nicer for Crawdad Creek. This but is the place on. that you you pretty much always wanted Sunny Mountain until I convinced you <laughs> that Crawdad Creek was the better option. You're very persuasive. I have my I have my vase. <laughs> bounce. bounce. <laughs> oh. I feel like there's no driveway here, first of all. There is no driveway here. Oh, okay. It's not just my imagination. This is like, okay, so all the pros of Sunny Mountain 
it's this is really funny actually all the pros of sunny mountain are the cons of crawdad creek and vice versa they are everything if these two properties could have been like next door to each other this could be one <laughs> all encompassed it's, it's in the same property. everything we want but one has the one and the other has the other so let's so this is bare land like yeah raw this is raw all right this untouched. is virgin all right, welcome this time of year to Crawdad Creek. Spare no expense. This is in a valley, not on a hill. It is heavily wooded. No clearing has been done beautiful raw forest topsoil. Let me show you why we call it Crawdad Creek. Ah! <laughs> what is... imagine what I'm about to show you? <laughs> Your mind cannot comprehend why. But you'll never get. <laughs> such, such an enigma for a name. So, <laughs> she's not really much to look at right now. It's just a little tiny creek running through the woods. It's not super beautiful, but that's where I, I let my imagination go crazy. And I imagine this cleared little bit of rolling hill, green hills here, animals grazing. And as you roll down the hillside, the beautiful grass, you meet this beautiful li little creek. If you imagine, this is fully forested, fully wooded, which a lot of people think of a forest as this amazing magical place of life hmm. but often hunters know this a very mature forest is actually kind of a Way desert thing. in its own way a, a deer moving through the woods finds a mature forest and with the exception of a couple acorns it can find off the ground it has very little to eat so it is it's why is that because mature trees crowd out the soil and so not a lot is growing on the soil for the animals to eat. Yeah, so and it's the mature very trees take the nutrition dark, yeah. and they crowd it. So the Grant Woods, this is something he talked about on our podcast years ago. The best thing you can do for mature hardwoods is cut them down. Now, this valley is not mature hardwoods. It's been recently it's logged. logged and then regrowth. So you're in this awkward teenage stage of the forest where everything is tall and lanky and ugly. <laughs> Oh, wow, look at you. It is very beautiful, though. <laughs> it photographs beautifully. Like, it's just this it beautiful looked, yeah. forest as you're walking through, and these streams Babbling little stream. are running through it. And, and right away, we looked at this. It's very soothing and calming. And I imagine, you know, putting a few, putting up a couple dams, because this creek runs constantly, but it's pretty shallow. So a couple little dam waterworks, pool, make some pools out of the creek where you could put a little fish or swim, and then and then clear the banks on the side of most of the trees where you could grow some pastures. And basically just picture a scene out of The Hobbit. Hobbits have been living and farming in the four farthings of the Shire for many hundreds of years. Where there's rolling green hills with little creeks and stone That's bridges. How you it, yeah. Like the Shire. Yeah. But where our hearts truly lie, isn't good to the... Uh, you'd have to cut down a whole lot of trees, oh, though, to get there. you'd have to fern gully that piece. <laughs> you, you would have to, like, cut everything down, just it, leave a few big trees. It could be beautiful. There are no pastures, but there's lots of growth it's and good soil. Wet. It is very wet. wet it's wet, a creek. Wet. Crawdad Creek. Now, we pitched both of these properties because we were seriously considering both. And at one point, we went from... You were thinking sunny... You swung completely over to Crawdad with yeah. the idea that that would be the place we would go. But the one problem, I'd say probably the one of the bigger problems for us at Crawdad that we haven't talked about yet, which is very important to us, it might not be to everybody with their property. Yeah, that's another point is figure out what's really important to, to you, you for and us, make sure that property has it or can have it. Being... YouTubers and podcasters, it's very obvious that privacy is super important to us. <laughs> to me, yes. Uh, I don't like to be close to a 
busy road or a road really, period? Yeah, for safety reasons, for privacy reasons. Sunny Mountain was nice for that. It's a long driveway, which is bad for snow removal, but good for privacy. Yeah, Sunny Mountain, we're at the top of the mountain. It's completely private. The The nearest neighbors you can see are... You can see them through uh, a telescope or binos. Yeah. Crawdad Creek is the opposite. There was a road... That runs parallel. Right, yeah. Actually through a piece of it. Yeah. And then parallel to it. And literally, yeah, it's on both sides of the road. And because it's a valley, the road kind of goes up the one side of the valley. You can see the entire parcel pretty much from the road. Pretty much the whole time. So for us... We we had really decided Crawdad was the right one for us because it had water and water is so important and it had growth and we could manage what we cut instead of having this clear cut for a property. But, but we ran into the problem of having a spot that was dry enough to put a home, dry enough to put some animals where they wouldn't constantly be in the mud and be sick. And private and enough. And also private where you couldn't see it directly from the road. And we tried. I mean, we walked all over that parcel <laughs> trying to find a good location. We brought your mom and dad in there because they know how to move water and they yeah. know what you need to build a road and build bridges. That's what people say, build a bridge. It is not that simple to build a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I've learned. Yeah. No, it's not. We you actually could park and then build a footbridge. Yeah. But it would have been even just clearing the path for the home location and making sure there was enough drainage for the home location so that we wouldn't be flooded all the time. Yeah, it was very cost prohibitive. Yeah. Which this is a great bit of advice. If you're looking for a diamond in the rough, but you're not actually really skilled in identifying what is easily fixable and what's not. Don't be afraid to get someone to help. Get some help. If you have a friend or family member if you're looking for someone who can help consult on the project, that's an option. My uh, AGM Earth, my parents' business, can even over Zoom help you consult with you uh, as far as property development goes. We'll have a link for that in the description where you can contact them. Uh, just one one walk is all it took. We took a walk with them with the objective of finding a location, putting in a driveway. Instead of because we we show them these properties previously, just as like which oh, aren't these great? Yeah, these are great. But now it was. How, okay. how will we do this? Let's, where and how? Where and how. And when we really started planning, this is where a house would go. This is where, this is how long the driveway would have to be to have high, dry, private ground to put our homestead on. We could do it at Crawdad. Usually anything is possible. Anything is possible. Money. That was my dad's Grampy line. says. Yeah, hey, if you got enough money, you can do anything. The figure he gave us for just establishing a driveway and a prep, prepping a site to build on was about $50,000. Which now, we haven't talked about our budget yet officially, no. but rest assured, <laughs> we don't have that 50, is a, a sizable chunk of it. And there's a perfect example where the cheap land may be more expensive to develop later on. Especially so you, you have to be if careful. You're, you're looking for the level of development that we all expect now in yeah. the first world country yeah. that we live in. Right. If you want to be able to drive th- on your driveway, so if you're going to gridlessness, if you're going yeah, to quad you want, on the trail, yeah. there's but if that you want a option. four-season driveway that's easily passable. This is a good place to say gridlessness has the life they do because they are more willing to be more hardcore than you and me. We've looked at their style of living and said... That's a little bit more hardcore off-grid. You don't agree? You think you can do it? Well, I think location-wise, we are happy with our like our location, with where we are in relation to my parents and your parents. Now, if you come to me and say, babe, I want to go to Alaska, I'd be up for some change. <laughs> like, I, I've, been, I've been talking about a snowmobile, so... That's true. But you I think for, for where that? we're picking. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be driving in and out of our driveway. <laughs> so. So we're not going to Alaska. And we're not going to Crawdad Creek. Yeah. We decided after taking a good hard look at the options, mm-hmm. although for a time you were like, you know what? No, I really do like this. Let's do it. 
we started pricing out the infrastructure that we would have to put in, even though it's still off-grid property, we want a driveway and a driveway we can drive for four seasons. Yeah, and here's a tip why I ended up saying in the end and why I think we both said Crawdad Creek wasn't for us. We were observing it through four seasons. Yeah. So while it felt very private yep. during spring and summer, once the leaves started to come down, we realized just how close we were to the road and how well used that road was. We yeah, thought, like, it's not a busy road, us. but it really is a lot busier than we thought. Yeah. And the house location would have been a lot closer than yep. either one of us wanted. Oh, yeah. So, so it's another tip. Observe your property. If you can. If you can if in you four can. seasons. There's the big announcement. Let the cat out of the bag. We have... We have picked, picked our property. A off-grid, cheap homestead property. And it's Bald Man Mountain. <laughs> I hope we don't lose any bald listeners. We we like... my It's granddaddy. I like bald listeners. <laughs> Gonna have to be... Uh, creative about our name for it sunny mountain it's is, gonna get is stuck. A, has a bit bald man mountain is not where i want to live sunny mountain is a <laughs> yeah so in future episodes of the podcast we'll start to tell you more about sunny mountain and our what are plans. you going to be doing with it soon we have to do obviously this is a diamond in the rough so no good soil no good growth no water well we got to cut and polish this diamond. We can fix it. We can. And we're going to talk about that in upcoming episodes of the podcast. Uh, I will add links in the show notes to my interview with Gridlessness and my interview with Grant Woods. Those are two great, really old episodes of the podcast. I know you're going to enjoy. Check them out. Links below. We'll see you guys in the next episode. waiting for go on